Hello everyone. We're in the middle of an exploration of a transition of models and leadership between the wise and the prophets. Now we said last week that though the wise will be the primary model of leadership heading into the second temple period, when the returnees from exile come back, they're accompanied by the last three prophets. And these three prophets manage to build into the structures of the lifestyle led by the wise three things. Number one, the mikdash. Right? They give the permission in the voice of God to rebuild the temple, a house where all of Am Yisrael can come together to concentrate in the presence of God. Number two, the structure of prayer. Interestingly enough, this will be avodah shebelev, the service of the heart, which happens in a makom, a place, right, where Am Yisrael can concentrate. Number three, they taught us the difference between tzedek and mishpat, not just the difference, but the dynamic. If mishpat lelokim hu, absolute justice, belongs to God. Once the prophets disappear, we'll have no one to speak in that voice. But tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, they'll teach us. You shall pursue relentlessly righteousness. And I want to argue that when the Torah uses tzedek as a noun to define evin shlema, the tzedek, right, that a whole just weight by which you judge other things, it's teaching us that the tools that we do have, the tools of measurement that the human being can bring to bear, intellectual, emotional, physical, spiritual, will allow us to measure and map our world. It just has to be done with the understanding that it, they're not absolute. Well, a non-absolute measure that is constantly applied over the course of history might actually give us a sense of what it is we're pursuing, a path we can trace through time. These are the three things, and ultimately, the distinction between the wise and the prophets will be, first of all, this shift from the primacy of experience of the will of God to the struggle to understand the will of God. Now, this understanding will take place both in the written word, the, the Torah, and the words of the prophets which are written down after it, and in the personal and national experience. How do I know what God wants from me right now? When I look at what Am Yisrael is going through, how do I know what God wants from us? What's interesting is that the oral law will serve as the bridge that connects the written law to the constant flow of personal and national experience. And the men of the great assembly, the fathers of the wise, will be the architects of the structures of the oral law that we are most familiar with. The other aspect of transition leadership will be the switch from the primacy of the pursuit of mishpat, of absolute justice, to tzedek, righteousness. This begins, first of all, because of a humble knowledge of limitations of self. We can no longer speak on behalf of God. We can only struggle to understand what it is that God wants of us. And number two, because of a hopeful sense of the ability to actually develop the tools that we do have. Remember, we're entering into this period of drush, of the pursuit of meaning and truth through the historical experience everywhere, throughout all time. And therefore, we have to have the proper tools to know whether what we're experiencing is real and true. It's amazing that the power of the seichel, the tool, the, the, the intellect, the primary tool of the wise, which is the seat ultimately of the neshama, of the soul, right, is to hypothesize, test, evaluate, repeat. And this is exactly what Am Yisrael will do throughout all time. The heart can also access this sort of analytic outward turning, but it's not its primary mode. And together, a uh, Shebelev, the service of the heart, and the power of the intellect will allow the soul to be the true instrument for the test of truth. Now, I said that the Anshe Gnesa Gedola, the men of the great assembly, were the leaders of the wise. So a very simple question, what makes them so great? Well, the Gemara and Yoma will answer that question specifically, but before we get to that answer, I want to look at their own words and see what they can teach us. You recall last week I mentioned that the first Mishnah in Pirkei Avot is a chain of attribution, the Mesorah, this handing down, not so much of information, but as modes of leadership which will articulate and transmit the Torah from generation to generation. Interestingly enough, it is the Anshei Knesset Dola who received from the prophets who will first give us any words on which we can hang an understanding of what their model of leadership meant to them. What did they say? Havu metunim ledin, bedin, sorry. Right? Be deliberate in judgment. What does this teach us about the world in which they're going to shape? Well, humility in the face of a complex reality. When we spoke in, when the prophets spoke in the voice of God, and our national existence was in the time of remes, of meaning in local context. As I said, we don't even know about the Chinese, much less do we care what they think about our assertion that God chose us, gave us the Torah, and sent us out into the world to fix the place. 
humility in the face of a new and complex reality. Number two, authority maintained through non-exercise. Deliberate in judgment means often, I'm silent. Now, this implies a couple of things. First of all, a sound relationship with the people that the very presence of the judge gives a sense of justice. And number two, a sense of reliability between the peoples and the leaders that when called upon, the leaders will indeed be able to apply that power. Now, interestingly enough, the courts will become the primary power base for the wise as we move through history. We see this already in the book of Ezra. If you recall, in the book of Ezra, in the ninth chapter, if you haven't read, I recommend going and read it. If not now, then soon. Right? The major challenge that Ezra faces there is the challenge of intermarriage. That the people, despite the experience of national expulsion and destruction, have still gone astray. And they've married the wives of the foreign nations around them. Ezra tears his shirt. He pulls out his hair. He dumps dirt on his head. He lays down before Makam Amidash and he cries out to God. But when he gets up, he takes action. And he says, everybody must be in Jerusalem in the next three days for an accounting. And if you do not, your property will be forfeit. Now, how on earth, how on earth could he do such a thing? This is a principle, by the way, which we'll learn as Hefker Beit Din Hefker. Anything which the Beit Din decla declares ownerless is indeed ownerless. Well, that's a nice luck principle, but where does he get the power to do such a thing? Why on earth would the people listen? Well, there's only one of two answers. Either real authority that is vested in Ezra by the people, or the threat of overwhelming force, right? Authority is something which we maintain through relationship. Force is something we exercise power over others. Now, the exiles knew the potential power of the Persians. They'd seen it as it had defeated Babylon and returned them to their land. But let's face it, Persia is awfully far away. And did they really think that Cyrus was going to send troops in support of Ezra's effort to have them divorce their foreign wives? I don't think so. Though I want to note that Ezra's mandate from Cyrus specifically included the ability to set up courts and to judge according to his laws. Nevertheless, the implied threat there is awfully distant. But the real implied threat was that of exclusion from the community. The world's a scary place out there. And it must be that they wanted to be part of Am Yisrael enough, despite the fact that they had married foreign wives, enough that the threat of exclusion was enough to draw them into listening to him and vesting him with the authority to declare other people's property ownerless. I want to remember this, because this dynamic between a non-halachic or non-Jewish power structure and the, the authority of the courts of the sages will appear a number of times through history. This is only the first instance, and it will be a dance that's negotiated between power and authority. The Hamidu Tamidim Harbe establish many students. Now, why would they do such a thing? First of all, because who saw their greatness more than their students? This is indeed what made them great, right? Therefore, the more students they had, the greater they would be. As simple as that. Number two, ed education is going to become not only a model of leadership, but an organizing principle for society. Right? The idea that education is a value unto itself, and there it also has its sort of applied, almost technological aspects of how to bring benefits, material, social, spiritual, or otherwise to society, is forged by the men of the Great Assembly. And lastly, the critical exposure of thought as a tool in the pursuit of truth, right? The Bate Major Soda are a place of conflict. Iron sharpens iron. One man sharpens another. People come together and they must lay their ideas on the table. And if it's true, then we'll listen. But if it's not, we'll tear it apart. This is a training ground internally for the external polemics and dynamics that we'll expose to through the entire history of our people in every corner of the world. The last piece of the Mishnah there is Vasu Siag Torah, make a fence around the Torah. Now, we spoke a little bit when we talked about the primary task of Ezra and Nehemiah as wall building, as what's the purpose of building a fence? We said, either you make some fence to keep something in or to keep something out. Now, in our case, keeping something in could be the period of experience which will allow access to the truth of the Torah, similar to that concentration of God awareness that allowed for a crystallization of the prophetic consciousness. Furthermore, as the Ramchal tells us in the introduction to Silat Di Sharim, that most truths placed out of their context, will appear false. And there's going to be a danger of exposing the Torah consciousness and taking it out to the people without having the proper context amongst the sages. I say the danger of, at the same time, it's going to be an absolute necessity because they're educators, not just philosophers. right? And what are they trying to keep out? Well, first of all, 
there's the cautionary principle here, right? If what's in the Torah is so important, then we want to protect it. And therefore, we're going to put the boundaries of the law further away. Now, a word. You, we're all familiar with the power of stricture to maintain distance. If I don't know where the edge of the cliff is, I'm going to build a fence that's six feet back to make sure. But what's often lost is what's, what the Gemara calls koch de heter adif. The power of permitting is actually stronger. This can be understood simply in my mashal of a fence six feet away from the uh, edge of the cliff is no more useful than my ability, if I know exactly where the edge of the cliff is, to walk up and wiggle my toes over the edge. So therefore, we want to be cautious about the cautionary principle. And lastly, there's going to be a power of process. Anything that we value, we should have to work hard to attain. And the fence around the Torah will check students at the door, will check my heart at the door, and to know whether what I'm pursuing is actually the truth or something a little bit more base. So one last word. The Gemara and Yoma asked the question, why were they so great? Well, it says that when Jeremiah came and saw foreigners destroying the temple, he took the word awful, nora, out of the hakel, hagadol, hagibo, nora, the mighty, awesome, and great God. And he took the word awesome, awful, out. And when Daniel came along and he saw that non-Jews were enslaving Am Yisrael, he said, where is God's might? And he took the word gibur out of the picture. And it took the men of the great assembly to bring this word of might and this word of awe back into the presence of God in the world. And next week, we'll speak about how they did.